Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, our discussion will focus on food insecurity and organizations that support family in need from around the country with special guests. Kim Dildine, Co-Chief Executive Officer of the Central California Food Bank. Vincent James, President and CEO of Dare to Care Food Bank in Kentucky. And Calvin Moore, President and CEO of the Community Food Bank of Eastern Oklahoma. So thank you all for joining us. We have a real picture, a snapshot through you into your communities and into this situation in, in the United States. And your each of your um, organizations, each of you represents a, a, a huge field and there's so much that you have in common. 37.2 Americans live in poverty. 37.2 Americans live in poverty. It's just it's just stunning, and 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 they're they're so intimately, our neighbors are intimately affected by food insecurity. We have a democracy that is incredibly strong, yet we have people who are working every day and are living with food insecurity. So let's talk about how this situation has unfolded. And and before the the show, we talked a little bit about how uh, the picture sort of before during. And during the pandemic, and now in this sort of endemic phase where we're, we're moving into a place where we have medications and, and the pandemic won't be as, as severe. Kim, could you give us a, a, a picture from Central California, the breadbasket of the world, right? It is. And so that's one of the really strange dichotomies um, in Central California. We grow the food for the nation and the world, yet one in four of our neighbors struggle with having enough food to eat. And so the food is there. Um, it's just having the access points. So pre-pandemic, we were serving about 280,000 individuals every single month. We 280,000? 280, 280,000 280, in our five county service area. And that increased 25% um, to about 3, 330, 350, depending on the week and the month and, and how that went. Um, and there was a slight softening over the summer, but that has started to creep up again, um, back up to the 350. And for us in Central California, um, one, there's huge economic pressures. CPI was around just under 9% last month, but food, housing, and gasoline way exceed that 9% increase year over year. And those are the basic things our, our neighbors are surviving on. And then we are facing um, drought here in Central California. And so a lot of land is being furloughed. Um, we have an agricultural economy, um, which is putting more people out of work. Um, and so we're seeing skyrocketing. So it's shifted from urban population now out to our rural communities. And you're talking about communities where the inflationary pressure, particularly fuel, has has, have, ha, has an immediate effect. Yes. It's not, it's not next week. It's today. It's, right. it's money that is going into the gas tank cannot be used for food. Calvin, uh, talk about uh, Eastern Oklahoma, totally different part of the country, right? Totally, di but, but not totally different problems. Totally different part of the country, but very similar problems, uh, particularly as it relates to, 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 to food security. And I think, um, you know, the the the, uh, the notion that Kim talked about earlier is something that that we're facing, you know, all across the country. Um, and it's, you know, what we experienced prior to COVID was uh, a rising uh, level and number of individuals and families who were needing support. Of course, during COVID, that was exacerbated. But but my thinking is that COVID really just laid bare a lot of the inequities, a lot of the problems that just were not being answered, were not were not being faced by the community. And then the convergence of COVID, the loss of jobs, the economic downturn, uh, all really forced. Uh, forced us all to pay more attention and to to see what was really going on and 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 like Kim there in Central California we have also seen um, just a consistent and steady rise um, in the need to serve more and more people. Um, Community Food Bank of Eastern Oklahoma serves uh, is one of two food banks in the state of Oklahoma and serves about 24 counties kind of along the eastern you know edge edge of the edge of the state vast majority of those counties 
are rural in nature. And so uh, they face particularly issues because uh, they've been consistently for decades facing economic downturns and challenges and how to create jobs and how to keep young families uh, there to keep their, their communities vital. But, but the other part of that is uh, many of them have become become some what a food, uh, food deserts. And so you, you have this convergence of uh, urban areas that, that are uh, blighted in the sense that they don't have um, um, access points to food, but you also have the same problems going on in, in rural communities. And, um, and so it's, a, it's an issue that's, that's persistent and that we're going to continue to see grow. We're going to come back to some of these systemic issues because what you're both saying really do point to systemic uh, issues. But let's let's go over to James over in uh, Kentucky. James, could you? I'm sorry, uh, Vincent. Uh, Vincent, could you give us the view from from where you sit? Because again, we're we're talking about different areas of the country, right? But again, very problem, very common problems, right? Yes, thank you, Mark, for having us on today. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share what's happening in our part of the world. Um, I've had the exciting privilege of being able to be in my new role as a CEO seven months and uh, learn a lot of incredible things that are happening in the arena of food bank and food insecurity. And, and you're absolutely right. We live in the greatest and wealthiest country in, in, the, in the world. There is no reason why everyone should have access to food. So we have to understand that it's definitely something more than just just even having access is to structural systems that have been put in place that we're seeing in terms of poverty. And so what we're seeing in, in, in Louisville, we're seeing the same thing that, that my colleagues, Kim and Calvin, have seen in their areas. We're, we're actually moving twice as you know, many truckloads of food now um, than we did prior to the pandemic. Uh, I'm seeing what I'm even believing, even a, a greater need now as we're seeing um, government benefits and the during the pandemic era in terms of uh, benefits being decreased and uh, seeing the need increase as it relates to inflation. And so we're seeing new people, uh, even more than what we've seen during the pandemic, coming into our food pantries and coming to our partners and community partners uh, needing assistance. You know, and I think when we think about, you know, food banking as a whole, they were set up to be an emergency stopgap. And we've been in a 52-year emergency, and something has to change. And those are the kinds of things that we're really looking at how we can not only feed the line, and you will have heard this before, but we want to end the line. So we have to look at how we address policy that is impacting the people that we serve. And you saw the same kind of trajectory that was described by Kim and by Calvin, where uh, before the the need was high, it spiked during COVID, and and it's 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 still sort of it's trailed off a little bit, but it's still very high. Is that correct? Yes, it is. It is still high, and it's and it's growing. Um, we're seeing even more of the working poor coming into our facilities, our you know our operations, our services. Um, again, people who have not seen or had the need for a food bank, but they're making life decisions at the gas pump. Do I, you know, get gas, put gas in my car? Do I go to the grocery to buy food for my family? And if I don't put gas in, I can't get to work. So we're seeing this complexity that's just continuing to be a circle um, involving in those who are most vulnerable. As, you know, Calvin had mentioned during the pandemic, we had seen all of the issues in our, in our society exacerbated by the pandemic. And the challenges that we're seeing now is that it's not slowing down. Uh, it's not reverting back to pre-pandemic numbers. It's actually increasing. So let's deconstruct the problem, who your clients are. So, you know, you have young families, you have elderly, you have individuals, you have uh, 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 people, uh, adults with children, um, you have uh, people of different races and different uh, education levels, different, different types of job skills. Um, Calvin, could you talk a little bit about who you actually see come in is it everybody or is it is it equally distributed amongst all walks of life? Does the college professor stand next to the uh, or, or, or or the business professional stand next to the uh, the janitor um, or the farm worker? Or are we talking yeah. about a particular profile or, or a, a series of profiles that constitute your your uh, average customer? Yeah, I think it's all of the above. And it really depends on you know, the, the timing. And I'll, I'll start off with an anecdotal story. 
that kind of will kind of illuminate this a little bit. Uh, we were doing direct service here and we had a gentleman who, who drove up and uh, had a nice uh, uh, European um, um, sedan and we served him and we're happy to do so. And he let down the window and he said, thank you so much for, for everything. And he said, just thank you for this. And one of our, one of our um, uh, teammates said, Hey, this is what we do. He said, well, I was afraid that you were going to judge me because of the kind of car that I'm driving. And, and for me, that just said everything, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter who you are. Hunger does not discriminate. And it could be a loss of a job. It could be a loss of a, a spouse, a spousal income. Um, we can never make judgments on who sh- deserves or who needs our service. We have to serve everyone with unconditional, you know, positive regard because we just don't know what situation they're in. And I can just tell you uh, that most of the folks that I talk to about the food bank's work who have never actually utilized the, the services at the food bank think we just serve the poor, the destitute. They almost, you know, they almost look at it um, as a as a soup kitchen, as a soup line, and it's 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 not that at all. And um, and it it could be anyone. And for the most part, we are serving working families. We are serving single moms single dads who are trying to feed their kids and make decisions uh, about medicine, about clothes, about transportation. And, and we, we, we can't really talk about the work that we do without challenging all of our stakeholders from donors um, to the general community, to our, our boards to say, hey, listen, we've got to take a leadership role in talking about poverty and talking about wage stagflation where where you know a, a wage stagnation where you where you see uh, uh, corporate profits at an all-time high um, an intergenerational transfer of wealth 15 trillion dollars unlike anything that we've ever seen in the history of the world happening and most of that money is going to change hands in the United States so you have this huge gap between those who are super super wealthy and those who are barely making ends meet. And, and we've got to take a leadership role in, in having those hard, com- forcing those conversations as well. But the, our client base stretches from the very poor to the working poor, to working class, to people who are just falling on hard times from all economic backgrounds. Part of your point is that, is that, our, is that we're preserving advantage for the advantaged, right? And so what we end up having happen is that if you fall out of that advantaged group, like the gentleman in the in the uh, European car, um, all of a sudden, uh, because you're no longer in that advantage uh, advantage group, you might end up in a in a situation uh, like that. We did a um, a um, a survey just now. It was very interesting. We said um, uh, talk about uh, 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 groups that you define as as being the highest having the highest need uh, for food. Uh, who are most food insecure. What was interesting about the response is that we gave a lot of different options uh, based in age, um, uh, race, uh, gender, and so on and so forth. Race was not included, although my uh, perception is, is that because uh, very very often wealth is divided along lines of race, that that, that is um, a factor. But people were responding more that it's really about wealth. And they said, children, seniors, working poor. The, the one area that, that got the most response was household led by single parents. Uh, Kim, is, is that correct? Is, is, do we have this even distribution of need, but households led by single parents um, have, a, have an additional uh, burden to bear when it comes to food insecurity? I mean, the one number one indicator of poverty is single mom or, or, or young, young motherhood. Um, children are expensive and it's a very challenging uh, journey to navigate. Um, and so we do find a number of, of single parent households um, in, in our lines um, and many working poor really back to Calvin's point while 
uh, communities of color are um, proportionally impacted at higher levels because they live um, in poverty statistically, or higher levels of poverty across our country. Um, it really does. Most of our families are working families. They are hardworking individuals trying to make ends meet. And there's about people who are working one or two jobs. They're working maybe 12 hours a day. Yep. Uh, and and they're working at a at a, at a really restricted um, um, hourly uh, rate. They're right. trying to manage their responsibilities as a parent, particularly if you're a single parent, you don't have anybody to to split that time with. They're trying to figure out how to pay the electric bill, how to pay rent, so that they have shelter, and then food comes in, and then uh, somebody gets sick. Yep. Right. That's that's what you're talking about. Yes, there's a very small percentage. It's less than 5% of the neighbors that we serve that are of working age that aren't actually working. And then, then you don't know if it's a disability or, or what it is. Um, a, you know, a third of our client neighbors are children. We have a significant number of college students who seek our services. A um, significant number of um, elderly, and then the working poor, and so it's a very, very small fraction of the population that um, is of working age and isn't currently employed. And the employment market has been uh, very tumultuous over the last two years, to, to say the least. So, are, are we are we in a situation where the people who are receiving the benefits of that labor, and it's all of us, right? It's all of us. If, if, mm-hmm. if I'm eating uh, um, a a uh, orange that is harvested out of out of your part of the country, Kim, or if I'm or if I'm buying something that was manufactured here in the United States or driven across our roads by somebody, I'm 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 a beneficiary. Am I basically benefiting from the fact that that person doesn't isn't paid a a, a living wage, uh, Vincent? Or, or, are we? also all in a certain way complicit by how we behave and how the 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 way work is structured in this country where in order to keep prices down to keep prices cheap that we're basically um, encouraging a certain group of people to remain at this rather impoverished working poor level uh, are we seeing a symptom of our own our own way of thinking about it? Absolutely, Mark. Uh, we are absolutely seeing the symptom. We are complicit in what we do when we do not take uh, our voice that we have, that we've been given to be able to speak on behalf of those who don't have a voice and demand change. I think we've seen mm-hmm. that, in, you know, in 2020, when we've seen all the protests, you know, that came about not only because of the injustice in terms of what we've seen in law enforcement, but that came as a result of people being sick and tired of being sick and tired of being considered second-class citizens and not having the opportunities and access points that everyone else has. And so we have a system that is broken here in our country that needs fixing. And and I think uniquely food banks are qualified to be able to lead in this area in convening. That's been one of the things that I've been fortunate enough to do in terms of the seven months I've been in my role is really convening leaders and addressing these systemic problems and how we're gonna work together uh, in our community to address it. But I think it's a national problem that we have to address as well, because we're seeing a country that is more divided than it's ever been in its history. Um, you know, whether the political spectrum you fall upon, one of the things that we have to agree upon that we have to, to prever- reserve, preserve the sanctity of humanity. And, mm. and that is comes in the fact in terms of what we're seeing in our country that has to take place in its leaders like us that have to voice that. Do we have um, a, a, a issue with our markets? I'm a very strong believer in free markets, in the whole idea of a market-based system solving problems based on supply and demand and, and market response. But it seems to me that what we have is a market failure and a, and a structural market failure when you have people selling their labor below the ability to put bread on their table. Um, how, how do you all see this? And, and is there a solution? I mean, it seems that the people who are um, growing the food should be able to buy the food that they're growing, right? I mean, that, that, that seems to be really yeah. 
so if you if they can't, that seems to be a mark yeah. of failure. Is, is, yeah. is going on a little bit of a manipulation well, uh, in, in which in which money is being accumulated in a way that impoverishes the very people who are generating the the source of income and by providing their labor. I, I just don't know. It's, it's, Mark, I would say. I would say that, and it's a, it's a great point. I really want to camp out on on what on what Vincent was was saying because I think it's a salient point and something that we all need to be to to uh, to be focused on. But it dovetails into what you were saying about the markets. The markets are the markets are what they are, right? But what we really what we really have a failure is in public and private partnerships. And it's not the private side that's that's failing. It's the public side. <laughs> I mean, we 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 do not have um, we do not have you active put this on business, right? You would you yeah. Would put this on business. So where where did you... well, it, I would put it both on business and I would put it uh, on 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 government. Um, we don't have progressive enough policies uh, that will help. Um, community-based organizations do a better job of serving the people that they need to serve and then helping those individuals who um, who are making below market wages advocate for and win uh, better, uh, better wages and benefits. And I think you're really seeing a sea change that's happening. I think we're really on the cusp of something revolutionary in this country because, as Vincent said, people are sick and tired of being sick and tired. They're sick and tired of struggling. You know, we always hear, hey, well, these, you know, um, these people wouldn't have to be on assistance if they just get out there and work hard. Well, guess what? People are working hard. They're working two and three jobs, uh, trying to make ends meet, trying to feed their kids, um, trying to clothe their kids, uh, uh, trying to uh, pay for medicine for an aging parent. And we have not really given the given them uh, the assistance that they need uh, just as a society. Part of this is a political issue. Part of this is a political will. Part of it, part of this is just cultural because we've always, um, um, uh, we always seem to kind of punish the poor for being poor <laughs> in this country and reward the rich for, for being rich, for not doing anything extraordinary, but just for being rich. And we do that through tax policy, uh, we do that through a range of other policies, and it's really hurting us a, as a country. And it's it's really it's really it's really come to a head. And so we ha- we have to make a change. Something that we're doing here is re- in in Tulsa is really advocating for the living wage, and and that is and that is something that I think is really picking up steam. I know food banks across the country are doing this, and and again to, to Vince's point, we're not just doing this for our employees, but we're also taking the lead in our community to, to raise our voices, to use our power to say, not only should we be doing this as a food bank, but other not-for-profits and other for-profits should be looking at increasing and producing a living wage because the, in the, and what we've got to change is we've got to help people to stop looking at not-for-profits um, as a part of the benefits package for low-wage employers. And if we get to that point where people can make a decent wage, well, then they can better support their families. And that's what's going to shorten the line. That's what's going to shorten the line. Jim, could you talk a little bit about your programs before the show? You had mentioned some of your programs that dovetail with what Calvin was saying. So we've entered into work the arena of workforce development. And while we're we're really trying to give people their first opportunity, first step into employment. And so um, we're partnering with our local mission um, and we are bringing in people who are just um, coming out of their drug rehabilitation program. Most of them. This um, is a religiously based partner. Um, it is. That, that is it's a religiously based partner. Um, and they have a number of um, individuals that um, were incarcerated or were uh, didn't 
um, become incarcerated because they opted to go into this drug rehabilitation program. Um, and so in their last six months, they're in the, the job phase, right? How do they um, seek employment, building a resume and all of that? And most of them have never had a legal job, a legal profession. Um, and so we're giving them the opportunity to build their resume and teaching things like showing up on time, initiative and problem solving, really what a lot of employers um, are looking for. Can they think outside of the box? Can they follow instructions? Um, and those that come through, they get, um, they earn wages while they're with us and we teach them warehousing, food safety, um, forklift certification. Um, and then we have great relationships with food manufacturers um, that then we're placing them in full-time permanent benefited positions. And while that is kind of the first step um, in their employment, part of our partnership the Fresno Mission has them um, enrolled in City College, so they're working on their education. Um, there's a lot of wraparound care services, and so one of the things that food banks are amazing at is collaboration. Um, we are very good at finding partners and others that are um, the best in their field and collaborating with them to do better for the neighbor. And so we have found that um, here with the, the mission. Again, they're feeding us neighbors, and that's helping us build boxes, sort food. Um, they're, they're helping us with the labor we need. They're earning a wage and getting something on their resume that then they can leverage into um, a legitimate position. So in a sense, though, that you're, you're kind of flying in the face of, of what Calvin was saying in the sense of um, you are actually seeing a need. You are filling it. You are um, uh being uh, part of the solution. So Calvin, it looks like we have this, this situation in which a nonprofit, and, and you're guilty of this as well, so you're guilty of, of, of problem solving that the government is not stepping into, right? And so are you, well, doing, right? Well, 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 I don't think it's exclusionary, right? So I think it's, I think it's, I think it's All both in. Because we're doing the same thing as well. And I love I love the fact that a lot of food banks are doing this across the country. We have a culinary training uh, program for for second chance applicants, folks who have kind of gone and followed the law, who who are in some type of diversion program. I don't think we're doing it to the extent that Kim is doing it because, and and I'm getting an idea here today. Thank you very much, Kim. I appreciate that. Uh, but that's what these conversations are all about, right? You know, learn, learning and adapting and 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 improving. Uh, because she's expanded it to all facets of the operation. And I think that's something I'm going to take away from this conversation. The business, but, the businesses that are but, supplying you with your foodstuffs are then be able to sure. take advantage of, of the labor that's coming out of Kim's program. So I think it's fantastic. We have, I think it, mm -hmm. and it's, it, it's that point, right? We're, we need to be an all in society. Everybody, everybody's involved. It doesn't matter if you're in business in government, if you're a volunteur, if you're if, if you're in the nonprofit sector, right, James? Uh, and I keep I keep uh, trying to give you your last. He has two. He has two first names. He has two first names. You know, you, you can you can always trust a person who has two first names. <laughs> so, uh, listen, uh, we're gonna we're gonna let you take take us out because we, we've come to the end of our our wonderfully informative uh, half hour. Uh, you know, the 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 points that, that have been made by you all is that it's an all in kind of thing. We have the country that we buy. Right. We have the country that we it's it's our everyday behaviors, isn't it? So how do we behave differently? How do we change this in a way that makes this issue better? Uh, could you could you inspire us with with some advice that we can actually translate into action tomorrow? Yes, I'll be glad to, Mark. I think, you know, one of the opportunities that we have before us, uh, just as we're experiencing, you know, unprecedented challenges in our country, we also have some unprecedented opportunities before us. And so I think in terms of when you're seeing with, in particular with food banks, having an opportunity to lead in areas that traditionally and historically we haven't led in before, but because we've been such a neutral partner in community, there's no other better entity within the nonprofit sector to be able to delve in in terms of providing the leadership necessary to make change because we realize we can't make the change by ourselves and we're structured in a way that we depend on partners to get our food out the door. The food bank is doing what it does best in terms of providing the food, 
but it's our partners that we're working with that are on the ground day to day that are impacting the lives. And so we have this infrastructure already built out. We have an opportunity to leverage the infrastructure that we have in place to do things we've never done before. And that's what Mm -hmm. we're doing in terms of reimagining our network. We have 270 partners that are serving 13 different communities in Kentucky and Southern Indiana. And so we're looking in ways and talking with them in terms of what other things can we provide for our neighbors, not only in terms of services, but how can we help them to even advocate more? Uh, How do we get people registered to vote? How do we get people to do a lot of different things to improve their quality of life and that we elevate society? And so I think food banks have a unique opportunity in leading in that area. It's it's a very inspiring message. Take us uh, take us out with uh, what you're basically saying is that we're more powerful. We are more powerful. We are each more powerful than we think to help uh, other Americans, to help others, our neighbors. We can actually take action. We are going to have the country that we invest in, whether it's investment in time or treasure. And and we need to be a lot more thoughtful in terms of what we're buying how we're conducting ourselves, and how we're interacting with others. Kim Dildon, co-chief executive officer of the Central California Food Bank, Vincent James, president and CEO of Dare to Care Food Bank in Kentucky, and Calvin Moore, president and CEO of the Community Food Bank of Eastern Oklahoma. You all are inspiring. Please thank your people. Thank your volunteers. Thank your donors. Thank your clients thank those who, uh, the businesses who contribute uh, to your success and your partners. You are inspiring for us all. And thank you so much for for helping us out to understand your world. Our next show is going to, again, be focused on AT Ukraine. There's a huge civil society crisis that emerges from that war. And we can learn very much from the people in Poland who are responding to their neighbors and Ukrainians in terms of uh, the Ukrainians who are displaced, in terms of how we can respond to our neighbors, so please join us on uh, on this next uh, this next uh, show on Tuesday. Have a great day, all, and stay safe, stay healthy.